I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows my gravity All right, here we go. Our first speaker, UC Berkeley zoologist, Aaron Person, on what's the point animal behavior and the value of niche science. Erin earned her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan, and she is now a PhD candidate in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. Erin has studied hyena sociality in, I believe in Kenya, and she now focuses on a wild population of California ground squirrels. Please welcome UC Berkeley animal watcher, she does love to watch your animals, and Wonderfest Science Envoy, Erin Person. Thank you very much, Tucker, uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to start off my presentation, if I can get my slides to advance. Oh, now, come on, here we go. Uh, with my acknowledgments, I want to uh, first give uh, thanks to Wonderfest, of course, and to my fellow science envoys and to Tucker uh, for putting this event together. I'd like to thank my, my lab at UC Berkeley, the Lacey Lab, uh, Team Squirrel, which is the group that I work with at Mills College, and of course, my funding sources. Um, with that out of the way, uh, I would like to uh, share with you a little bit about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. As uh, Tucker said, I spend a lot of my life sitting outside, uh, staring at squirrels and writing down everything that they do. Uh, that seems like maybe a fun way to spend an afternoon, but it's sort of a strange way to spend a PhD. Uh, so it might, might lead you to ask a question that I have been asked, I think more than any other question uh, that I have gotten since I began studying animal behavior, which is, uh, what's the point? Uh, what's the value in what you're doing? What's, what's the point of studying the behavior of squirrels? I think this is a very reasonable question. I should be spending all of my time doing something that is valuable to do. Um, I find animals fascinating. Uh, I find their behavior fascinating. I want to know more about them all the time. Hopefully you do too, but is that the only reason behavioral ecologists like myself do this? Is that the only reason it's interesting? Um, I say no. Uh, and my task for today is to uh, try and convince you that there is value in the work that I do. And there is value in understanding the lives of animals beyond just satisfying our curiosity. What's the point? There's my question. And that's what I'm hoping to answer for you today. So uh, in order to do so, I'm going to share with you some of my work studying animal behavior uh, and a little bit of someone else's work. Um, and I hope that you walk away from tonight with a renewed appreciation for the wonderful lives and fascinating lives of animals. Uh, and the things that we can learn from them. So I started off talking about squirrels and we'll get to them. But before we do, I'd like to start off with uh, this beautiful creature, the spotted hyena. Before I became, uh, came to grad school, uh, I was able to spend a year in Kenya uh, studying these beautiful and fascinating animals, the spotted hyena. Um, I got to work with the Mara Hyena Project at Michigan State. Uh, and spend a year following these animals around. I got to see them socializing and hunting and fighting and playing. Uh, I got to know their personalities and deal with their struggles and triumphs and sort of live alongside them. And during this time, I, I began to think about what I think of as my first reason I think it's important to study behavior. Uh, and that is that learning about animals can teach us about ourselves. Now, hyenas are uh, very large animals, they're very intelligent, and they're very, very social. Uh, that, all of that may sound a little bit familiar because uh, there's another large, social, and very intelligent animal that we're quite familiar with, which is, of course, ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of similarities between us. And of course, we have to be careful not to anthropomorphize animals. Uh, we can't project human characteristics onto them. But I think there are so many similarities between us, so many characteristics that we share that studying animals similar to ourselves can shed light on our own experiences, the things that we move through the world and interact with, 
Uh, and there's ways that we can ask questions of animals that can help us inform uh, ourselves. So I'd like to give you an example of this. Uh, some of my work when I was studying hyenas in Kenya uh, was playing tug of war with hyena cubs. Once again, fun activity, great way to spend an afternoon. Uh, why on earth were you playing tug of war with hyena cubs? Uh, I was collecting saliva. So I would dangle this stick out the side of the car. I would cover it in vegetable fat so that the hyena cubs would come up and chew on it. They'd soak it with their spit. Uh, and then we could freeze the saliva, send it off to our lab back at Michigan State, and they could analyze it for hormone content. Uh, through this, we could ask all kinds of really interesting questions. Uh, one of the hormones that we focused on is known as cortisol uh, and is commonly known as a stress hormone. It's released in the body when you are undergoing stress. And this is true of uh, many animals. So high cortisol means high stress. This lets us ask all kinds of really interesting questions about stress and the body's reaction to the things happening around it. My interest lay in the field of social behavior. Uh, so I was curious about uh, social behavior and social relationships and stress. And, and so was another grad student who worked on the project uh, who led the work that I'm about to tell you about, which is Tracy Montgomery. Uh, so thinking about social relationships, one of the earliest social relationships we humans experience, as well as hyenas, uh, is that of a sibling. So most hyenas are born as a pair. Uh, early on, they duke it out between them and they establish a dominant sibling and a subordinate sibling. The dominant sibling gets uh, priority access to milk. They get to beat up on their subordinate sibling whenever they like. Uh, it's a pretty sweet gig if you are the dominant sibling. The subordinate sibling has to get a little bit more creative with how they are acquiring milk, like this one who is nursing upside down in this photo here. Um, maybe less access to milk, they get beat up on a little bit more. Life's a little bit tougher for a subordinate sibling. But there are also some individuals who are born alone. Uh, they don't have a sibling, they're, they're just a singleton. Um, and you may think that that's a pretty sweet gig. They don't have anybody beating up on them. They get full access to all the milk that they could want. But using the salivary hormones that I was able to collect, we found something interesting, which is that the singletons, which are our far left group over here. So we have uh, cortisol levels over here on the left side or on the uh, Y axis here and our three groups here on the bottom. So the singletons had the highest level of cortisol. So the highest stress compared to either the subordinate or dominant cubs. Now it makes sense that subordinate cubs would have higher stress than dominant cubs uh, but we were pretty surprised to find that singletons had the highest stress. And right away, this leads to all kinds of questions about hyena lives. Uh, is it important to have an ally early in life that can kind of help you navigate the social waters? Um, do you have a built-in playmate who helps you reduce stress if you have a sibling versus when you don't? These are interesting questions to ask in hyenas, but if you kind of broaden your thinking, you can apply them to other social animals, including humans and my cat, please excuse me. Uh, maybe there are advantages to being close to your relatives so you can work together and accomplish things you wouldn't be able to accomplish with you or by yourself. What, what are the types of physiological consequences that you can experience related to your social interactions? These are the types of things we can set our minds to when we are studying animals that apply not just to those animals, but also to ourselves. So, Let's leave the hyenas behind for a moment and turn to the work that I'm currently conducting. Uh, I stayed interested in social behavior after I left Kenya, and I joined a project uh, studying social behavior in California ground squirrels. I wanted to know how these social relationships that animals go throughout their lives affect other aspects of their lives. So I began my PhD work on this subject. In order to do this, uh, we have to capture and identify our squirrels. Uh, so we first trap them using uh, peanut butter and sunflower seeds, which they're absolutely obsessed with. Uh, and then we have to be able to tell our squirrels apart in order to observe their socializations. So we use uh, hair dye uh, to mark the back of the squirrel in a unique pattern that identifies them alone. I'm showing you drumstick here. So this is a little uh, chicken wing. Uh, and then we let them out into the world and we spend many hours of our lives uh, observing them at play, at foraging, at fighting, all the things that they undergo in their lives. With this social data, we can create social networks that look like this. 
So each one of these circles is circles or squares is an individual. And the lines that connect them represent the number of interactions that connect those individuals. That could be play, it could be fighting, just some kind of social interaction. The thicker the line, the more social interactions those two squirrels have undergone. Right away, looking at this image, we can start to draw some conclusions about what's going on in this social, this social network. First of all, we have some highly social individuals, like this one that I have the arrow pointing to here, right in the middle of a cluster of individuals, lots of ties to many other squirrels. The ties that that animal does have are quite thick, which means this animal's spending a lot of her time foraging. But there are some other individuals in this population that are much less social. Uh, this individual up here doesn't have ties to anyone else, didn't spend that much time interacting with any other squirrel in the population. This is just sort of interesting to note, but it sets up kind of a beautiful natural experiment that I'm taking advantage of. By using these social and asocial squirrels, I can compare them and look at the consequences of being social. I can see if you are very social or if you are asocial, what does that look like for other aspects of your life? Some of the information that I'm looking at as part of my PhD work is whether or not animals are making use of social information. They often forage in groups, and I'm looking to see if they're paying attention to what their neighbors are doing in order to find food quickly or efficiently. I'm also interested in some physiological consequences of stress. Does being social affect the microbes in your gut or the levels of stress, that cortisol hormone I talked about earlier, in your body? Again, I think these things are very fascinating, but it's squirrels. It's the gut microbiome of a squirrel. Why is that important? Why do we care what that means? So it comes back to our original question. What's the point of all this work that I'm doing as part of my PhD? This is my second reason that I, I think that studying niche science or something like animal behavior is very important. And this is the fact that I think of science as a jigsaw puzzle. It's kind of a cryptic statement, so let me break it down. Here we have a single puzzle piece. It's a little blurry, but you get the idea. Uh, by itself, it doesn't really give us a lot of information about what's going on. You can see a little bit of color and shape, uh, but not much else. But when we put that puzzle piece in the context of the greater puzzle, it suddenly makes a lot more sense. Uh, you can see everything else that's going on around it. You can't finish the puzzle unless you have that one piece. It's important to the greater picture. And this is how I think of science. I think of my dissertation as one piece of this puzzle. Uh, the consequences of social behavior in California ground squirrels is this one piece. By itself, it's interesting, but it lacks context. We don't know how it informs everything else. But instead, I'm using the information that I collect to build on the work of people who came before me, the other pieces that are part of the puzzle, and I'm helping inform the work that is going to come later. In this case, we can think about this whole puzzle as something like the evolution of social behavior. We can answer, by answering these small questions within the squirrels, we're helping answer the big questions like, why do animals live in groups? How did social behavior evolve over time? So my strange little microcosm and the soap opera that I'm observing every day in squirrels is helping us understand big pictures like the evolution of social behavior. Now, I'm going to step away from my own work for a little bit and tell you a story that I learned about a few years ago, because I think it helps reflect a point uh, that I'm trying to make. I'd like to introduce you to Sir Cyril Clark. Uh, he was born in 1907 and died in 2000, uh, and he was a very well-respected geneticist. And crucially for the uh, story I'm telling here, he also had a hobby. Uh, Sir Cyril Clark was a lepidopterist. Uh, he bred butterflies for fun. He and his wife, Lady Frida Clark, uh, loved swallowtail butterflies and they bred them and observed how they changed over time and they, they loved to raise them. For any lep lepidopterist in the audience, I, I know that this isn't the correct family tree. It's just for illustrative purposes. Um, and he noticed something interesting while he was breeding his butterflies. There was a certain pattern to the way that they, the color patterns and the, uh, the colors and patterns on the wings of the butterflies was inherited. And he noticed it was quite similar to the way that the RH factor in human blood was inherited. So the RH factor is the structure on the outside of a red blood cell 
that determines whether or not you have positive or negative blood type. Uh, now this kind of interesting, fascinating that there's something in butterflies that is similar to the inheritance pattern of humans. Uh, but this is in fact very important because Sir Cyril Clark noticed uh, that he could use the information he'd gained from the breeding of butterflies to help with RH disease, which is something where uh, a negative mother who has a negative blood type, if her partner has a positive blood type, it is possible that their offspring would have a positive blood type. And in this scenario, the mother's body doesn't recognize the structure on the outside of the blood cell of her own offspring, and her body begins to make her immune system begins to make antibodies to attack her child's red blood cells. This led to 10,000 plus infant deaths a year prior to Sir Cyril Clark making his discovery in butterflies. And with his geneticist colleagues, he was able to come up with a treatment for this, which would entirely prevent women's bodies from attacking the, child, the, the blood of their offspring and essentially treated this disease. Uh, which, to use my own metaphor, he was able to assemble his puzzle pieces of his interest in lepidoptery and his background and career as a geneticist and piece them together in order to create this wonderful advancement in preventative medicine. So this leads me to my final point for this evening, which is the idea that you never know what you're going to learn. Of course, I don't think every scientific study in the world is going to lead to some life-saving advancement in medicine that will save everybody's lives. But I tell the story to illustrate the point. Sir Cyril Clark didn't know that he was going to cure RH disease when he set out to study butterflies. He just loved butterflies and he wanted to know more about them. We don't know what we don't know. We can't predict what we're going to find out when we set off to study something. The only way to find out is to cast our nets wide and study broadly, and not just the things that seem important. Yeah, Aaron, thank you. you. You put together a very nice jigsaw puzzle for us. Thanks very much. You'll get some well-earned applause at the end of our two-part presentation. And I want to apologize to folks before I welcome questions because I failed to let many folks in who entered a little late, but I was somehow tonight incapable of, of clicking that little admit all button during the beginning of actually mainly leading out for you, for you late arrivers, my monologue, my introduction of Wonderfest. So you didn't miss that much. I'm very glad you're here. You might know that in your absence, that early absence, I referred to you as Wondernauts. So forgive me for that, <laughs> your in absentia um, description. All right, so let's see. There are no questions in the chat. I'm looking for a hand raised while you consider raising a hand and then um, unleashing your question via live audio and video. I will ask Erin a question. Erin, I uh, referred to you earlier as an animal watcher because I, I remember reading in, in your biography that you're, um, that's what you, got you started. You learned that people could make a living by watching animals. Do you still have a kind of visceral affection just for being in the field and watching ground squirrels or hyenas? Very much so. I, I spend uh, all of my summers out in the field observing animals, and I'm currently teaching a class in the natural history of uh, vertebrates in California. Uh, and it's such a joy to be able to bring my students out to the field and teach them the way that I see the world, which is sort of getting distracted by everything around me all the time because I'm curious about it. And I want to know more. Uh, and just spending time being quiet and observing the natural world, I feel like I can learn so much about the, the animals around me. Great. Thank you, Erin. All right, we have a question here from Paul Switzer, Professor Paul Switzer at Stanford University. It could be a tough question for you, Erin. <laughs> well, that won't be, I hope. Uh, so my question is just uh, with regard to the uh, hyenas and squirrels, the variation in their degree of social interaction with some individuals more or less having little or no interaction, others having a lot, interacting with many of their, of their, um, uh, of their uh, friends and relatives. Uh, so my question is, is there, is there some, um, uh, some physiological basis for this variability? Because can you explain the variability either in terms of 
size, for example, or coloring or, or some other attributes that might uh, explain the variation that you see? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and it's part of the dissertation research that I'm undergoing right now is trying to see if we can identify what it is that leads to some of that variation. Um, unfortunately, we don't know right now. It's one of the things we're looking at. We know it's relatively stable over time. Uh, we can come back to the same field site year after year and study the same animals, and we will see an animal that was asocial last year tends to continue to be asocial the next year, uh, and, and likewise for very social animals. Uh, so we think some of it just has to do with innate personality. Um, some of the squirrels are very bold and, and everybody's business all the time and don't show a lot of fear around humans. And those also tend to be the squirrels that are quite social, uh, whereas the ones that tend to be a little bit more fearful, avoiding new things, also tend to be pretty asocial. Uh, so like us, animals have personality and we think that plays a big role in how social they tend to be. So, so one of your, if I could just continue to question a little bit, so one of the attributes that may explain this variation might be age. Is that what you're suggesting that you become, well, is, is, that, is that a difference or? Um, but, but you also mentioned that it doesn't change much with time, which would sort of counter the other things. So, so there's right. no reason just because of age that a uh, social animal would, would reduce their degree of interaction. Right. We tend to see more social behavior in young animals. Uh, so the sort of first, the year's pups often tend to be quite social. They spend a lot of time playing and interacting with others and the adults may be a little bit less so. But if you look at the most social pups and then the most, you know, they tend to be the most social adults the next year. Uh, so even though there is some variation over age, it seems like even across time, the same individuals tend to be more social. And we think that has something to do with uh, you know, brain chemistry, whatever it is that makes us us and makes us vary from each other. Uh, we think it's similar in animals. Thank you for your question, Paul. I see we have one from Stuart, a Wonderfest regular, a wonder not, I dare call him. Stuart, will you uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and turn on your cam? Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear and see me. Erin, um, I appreciated uh, your uh, presentation very much. You, you mentioned uh, that you studied um, the gut microbiomes of the animals uh, you studied. I presume that was the, uh, the squirrels and the um, uh, African... Um, hyenas? Hyenas, thank you, yes. Um, so I was wondering, is there much uh, variability between those gut microbiomes? Because I presume that they, uh, they're eating the same diet. Um, and, um, how, and did you, were you able to correlate that... Uh, with uh, their 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 behaviors, their personalities, uh, and uh, if you believe that 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 does uh, significantly affect the individuals, um, can you can you identify that or isolate that from um, from their social ability to to you know to to, to be the same or, or different uh, you know copy behaviors? Th thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, we've hit the nail on the head of the topic of the third chapter of my dissertation, which is very much in progress. Uh, from the preliminary data that I have, uh, we do see a fair amount of variation between squirrels, even though they are all pretty much eating the same thing. Um, and you've exactly nailed the predictions that I'm, I'm making that we're going to look at with larger populations as I'm analyzing my data, which is, uh, do the more social squirrels pick up other microbes from other organisms that they're interacting with. So if you are socializing with a bunch of other squirrels around you, are you trading microbes during those interactions, which might lead you to have a more diverse microbiome, for example. And we know from human literature and other literature in, in other mammals that more diverse microbiomes can lead to a more robust immune system. It can mean that if you have a disturbance to your gut microbiome, that it bounces back faster. Uh, so there can be some, you know, advantageous physiological consequences to having a more diverse microbiome, which we think might be associated and has been shown in other mammals. And we're hoping to, to see the same in the squirrels. Thank you. Great, Stuart, thank you. Checking. It looks Judith. like there was one other question yeah, in the chat. Judith asks, how large an area are the squirrels in and how do you keep track of them? 
Yeah, uh, my field site is in a uh, park uh, and there's a fenced in area, I'd say roughly the size of a football field. We know the squirrels range over a larger area than that, um, but we just observe them in that area and they're very consistent. <laughs> so we're, we're able to come day after day and we know we're going to be able to find the same animals. And then if we come back a year later, we will catch many of those same animals again. Uh, there's some movement, some will move away and some will move in. Um, but we microchip them all like you'd microchip a cat or a dog. Uh, so when we catch them year after year, we can scan them for that microchip and know it was the same individual that we, we caught the last year. Um, and they, they don't range over too large an area. So it's relatively easy for us to kind of sit in one spot and, and watch them socialize and go about their lives. Thank you for the question, Judith. Maybe I can squeeze one here again. Early, earlier, Aaron, I believe you mentioned to me privately that hyenas in their sociality can become, let's just say violent with each other. There could even be something akin to a, a hyena assassination or, or a regime change, that kind of thing. Would you mind describing that or have I missed the boat entirely? Oh, you're correct. Uh, a hyena society is very regimented. Um, they live in a hierarchy. Uh, so there is someone who is the uh, top dog, as it were, although hyenas are more related to cats than they are to dogs. Wow. Um, she is the matriarch. She's female always. Uh, and then uh, it's nepotistic. So you, in, you pass your rank onto your kids. Um, and so we can have a very strict sort of linear hierarchy of who everyone is. And they use violence uh, and some ritualized aggression, which is to say uh, like a threat, but without the violence behind it in order to maintain that hierarchy. Um, but we have seen instances where there are coups, as it were, someone uh, overthrows whoever is in charge. Uh, and often they gather a lot of allies together um, and will... Uh, you know, sort of throw, overthrow whoever is currently the highest in the, the hierarchy. Um, yes, it's very, <laughs> very Game of Thrones is I think how I described it previously. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Aaron. I will keep, steer, steer clear of uh, hyenas, even if they don't extend that kind of oh, aggressive behavior towards humans necessarily. And, and I'm astounded to learn that hyenas are more akin, I guess, genetically to, to uh, cats than to dogs. How interesting. What? Yeah. All right. We'll get to thank Aaron in a big way after uh, our second presentation here. Thank you all for your questions. And Aaron, thanks for a great presentation. Stanford statistician Ben Seiler will present Understanding Machine Learning. Ben earned his bachelor's degree in his bachelor's degrees, I believe, in physics, economics, and mathematics. Those are earned at Williams College and he is now a fourth year PhD student in statistics at Stanford. Outside of research in machine learning and what is called algorithmic fairness, Ben enjoys the three Bs, baking, brewing, and baseball. Please welcome Stanford statistician and Wonderfest Science Envoy, Ben Seiler. Thanks, Tucker. Um would you be able to remake me the host? I just want to apologize. I was feeling that I've, um, I've been having some internet difficulties with the storm tonight, and Xfinity has decided to uh, hold this presentation slightly hostage. So, um, in advance, I apologize if I cut out, and I may need to do part of this presentation from my phone, but hopefully that won't happen. Um, you're and you're doing this on a phone slide. now? No, I'm not on the phone right now. So okay. I'm hoping to not have to switch because that feels right. like it would be very difficult. And there's um, a there's a storm where you live. Yeah, there's a storm here. It seems like it is at least in Menlo Park. Um, yeah. Wow, the mean streets, the mean skies of Menlo Park. I'm yeah, I, I think it's surprised. because it hasn't rained in six months or however, oh. and, and they weren't prepared. Anyway, um, so apologies for that, but hopefully it won't interrupt anything going forward. Um, so, so good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, my my title. Understanding machine learning is, is a little too vague, and so in particular, I'm interested in um, algorithmic decision making using machine learning, and how to understand how those decisions are made. Um, and so that's a lot of buzzwords and jargon. And so I'm going to decompose a little bit as we go and, and start with sort of what are the types of decisions that are being made and why is this important. And so the answer to what kind of decisions are being made is the truth is that it's, it's more than you think. Um, so 
there are a lot of situations where they could be being used. And in fact, um, these types of uh, automated algorithm decision-making processes are already being employed in areas that you might not have been realized. And so um, there's a, a big drive in the medical community to not necessarily completely rely on these types of tools, but at least use them as part of their process. And so answering questions like, does my patient need this, this medical test that might cost money and time? Should we be uh, performing this test on this patient? Um, questions like, uh, I've applied for a credit card application, should it, should it be approved or not? And, and that can be automated away. And, and in some cases is. Um, uh, interesting local example of how, how much uh, donor platelet product should I keep at the hospital today? So how much should I have on hand for my patient's needs? Um, and then yeah, in the uh, judicial setting of, of should I should the defendant be released on bail and what should that bail be tied to? And so these types of decisions are, are already being at least partially automated. Um, and so as that type of behavior becomes more widespread in society, um, we are going to care more and more about how these things work, you should already feel like you have a very strong vested interest in, in how to understand these processes, how are these decisions being made. Um, so I, I used a lot of jargon, like I said, algorithmic decision-making, what is an algorithm? And an algorithm is just a very, unfortunately, broadly defined term that applies to lots of things. And so um, it's, it's a set of rules that we use to solve a problem or perform a calculation. And this is, this is overly broad and, and not a super useful definition. And typically when someone's talking about an algorithm, they're talking about a computer algorithm. And so um, solving a problem, especially with a computer, that, that's still a little too vague for us. And so um, an example of a basic algorithm, here's my, uh, my favorite cartoon, how to play dictionary, you draw the picture, check if they guessed correctly. If they didn't check, if they didn't guess correctly, you point at the picture again until they guess correctly. You just keep repeating that and eventually you'll win dictionary. And I think that's, uh, you know, it, this is a very simple flow chart, um, but it's, you're following this set of rules to get an outcome. And there may be some inputs like in drawing the picture or, or um, you have, in this case, the input is the other person guessing. Um, and so another sort of simplistic uh, algorithm that I'm gonna want to not call an algorithm going forward, but technically um, you count an algorithm is, is you know, if you think back to your elementary school days of learning what a function is, you take in some inputs and you get an output, um, that could be, if you were using this overly vague, broad definition of algorithm, that's an algorithm too. Um, I'm gonna be more specific so that we can use our language a bit more precisely. And I'm gonna call this a model. Um, and so again, you can think of this as it's just a, an elementary function. So we're taking an input and we get an output. And for in our case, that output is gonna be our decision. So our inputs are gonna be say the patient records, and the output is, do they need the test? And so why do I make this distinction? Why am I calling the algorithm decision-making? Um, so next, before I say that, is what is machine learning? And this will sort of elucidate the, uh, the, the distinction. And so machine learning is a buzzword. It's a subfield of artificial intelligence, which is another buzzword. Um, and there are lots of other buzzwords in this area. So statistical learning, deep learning, these are all terms you'll hear thrown around and they, they are different than each other in some ways, and I'm not going to focus on that. So today, let's, the key takeaway here is, uh, in aggregate, they're all more or less concerned with designing complicated algorithms that use data to build models. So they have a, they are a set of rules that build another set of rules that makes a decision. And the way they build that intermediate decision, that the intermediate model that we care about, is they use a bunch of data. Um, that's the thing that generally uh, stitches them together and why we like them. And in general, that, that model is good at making its decisions and they might measure that in some way. Like, you know, uh, in the case of the patient, it maybe it decides to give the test to people who are more likely to have the disease. And so it's doing a good job potentially. And that's why we wanna use it. Um, and so here tonight, we are not concerned with the machine learning aspect. The, how do I build the model? How do I train the model to do a good job? We are going to assume that's already been done. And so what we're concerned with is once we have the model, which again, is just this rudimentary function, we give it input so the patient, uh, it, it processes that, it has some understanding of how, you know, what I multiply each input by, how I add them together or, or how I have them interact and I get an output and it makes a decision. And I want to understand how did it make that decision? What was important in making that decision? Um, because at the end of the day, the, how it was trained is not really relevant, right? It could have been trained by someone just writing all the rules down by hand if it's being used in the world, I wanna know how it's being used or why it's doing what it's doing as it's being used. So, so we get back to the question of how does this model work? 
we have our inputs and we have our outputs. So what kind of questions can we ask? I wanna know how the decision was made. Um, in most cases, it might be too complicated to really fully understand every moving part of the model, even if you understood every moving part of how the model was built. Uh, so that's an important distinction. Um, so I like to think about how I ask this question um, from the point of view of three different large categories of stakeholders. And so the first category of stakeholders is the group of people who are employing the model. So in our examples, that was the doctor or the credit card company or the judge or the hospital. Um, and so when they're asking this question, it's for many different reasons. Um, one might be as a diagnostic tool. So if the doctor were to find out that uh, when we're making decisions, your favorite color seems to be really important in determining whether we give you this test, then they might think that there's something wrong with the model. It's doing the wrong thing. It doesn't match what we physically understand about um, this type of diagnosis. And so maybe we need to change the model. Um, but we generally think about this on an aggregate level. We care about what's going on on average. Another group of stakeholders that you, you know, are really gonna care about this are the end user. And so in our, in our example, maybe the patient going to know why, why they were, um, why they're given the test or, or the customer wants to know why their credit card application was declined. And maybe they wanna know specifically what they could change about their input to get a different outcome. What, what could I do differently to get my credit card approved next time? Um, and they're gonna care less about what the first group cares about because you know, if, if on average income is the most important thing, but our customer has a high income and that's not why they got their credit card application declined, then it's not gonna be very much solace to them to know that you know, well, actually you were, you were doing fine in the thing that matters the most because it doesn't tell them what to do next time. Um, and then a third group that often gets overlooked, um, some, any kind of body of oversight uh, over, these, over these decisions, if they don't understand how the decisions are being made, then it's very difficult to regulate the decision makers. Um, and you could imagine that if the decision maker is using inputs that should be protected either for privacy reasons or for fairness reasons, then they might be concerned. And so if it popped up on average that a protected, uh, protected class from a government perspective is being used to make a credit card decision, then they would wanna intervene potentially. And so if we don't have a good way of measuring what's important in making the decisions and how the decisions are made, then we lose the ability to sort of impose that type of reasonable oversight. All right, so what kind of questions can we answer is a little different and it depends a bit on the model. And so, in the case of very easy models, sometimes called white box, I don't like that turn of phrase, but white box models, um, the most transparent models, a human can just understand them fully. I can fully internalize what's happening in the model to the point where I could you know, easily describe what's happening and I could easily answer the question of why was this decision made? For things that are more complicated than that, we sort of have to ask less uh, specific questions. So, Maybe the question that I like to ask and that we like to look at is, which inputs matter? Can I rank them? Maybe going a little further, can I actually quantify how much I want to attribute the output to each input individually? So, you know, instead of a, an up-down decision, if we go to the how much platelet should I have on hand question, if the answer was, you know, 800 units, um, how can I attribute that to all the different inputs? In this case, our inputs may be, you know, numbers of different types of patients or what day of the week it is, things like that, um, that we know affects this. And so to give an example of the models that are sort of easy to understand, here's a twin model. Um, this is not, not a real model, but it's how it may, my, in my head, how my daughter might decide of what to eat, if, uh, what, what toy to put in her mouth um, that's on the floor. And so we ask a question here, this is a decision tree, it's a simple decision tree. And we say, well, what color is the toy? Is it yellow? We go to the left, is it a book? Yes, okay, so then she'll put it in her mouth. And if you say no, is it spiky? And if it's not spiky, she doesn't put it in her mouth. And so this model is small enough that I can understand fully what's happening. If you brought me a toy, I could say, oh, well, you know, she's not gonna eat that because it's not a book and it's not spiky. I, know, I can see other things from this model, right? I can tell right away that color doesn't matter. If I go down the left side of the tree or the right side of the tree, she's gonna eat or not eat, irregardless of the color that we, the toy was. And so this is a pretty simple model. And I don't have to worry about trying to calculate or quantify how important the features are because I can really sort of transparently understand. Um, but even if I go a little bit more complicated, 
I lose the ability to do that as a human, right? This is, you know, maybe has a dozen inputs and they pop up in different places with different cutoffs. And already, even if I sat here for an hour trying to parse what was going on here, I'd have a pretty hard time understanding what the, like, the cutoffs are and what the defining uh, borders are for how to make these decisions. So to the point where it's, it's too difficult. Um, and so what do we do there? We have to then get back to this idea of trying to quantify how important the inputs are. That's sort of the, the best we can do. And so another simple model, oh, before, so, so if a model were complex, I would ask this question in general. And so the most complex model here being the model, I don't know what's going on in the middle. I have my three inputs, I have an output, I don't know what's happening. Do we have any chance of answering the question here? And the answer to that is sometimes yes. But before we do the hard thing, can we answer these types of questions for the easy models that we know that we otherwise could understand? Maybe. Um, and so this another simple model of then the simple decision tree is a simple linear model. And this is, a, you know, you, in, in elementary school, you, you learn about functions and, and this is a pretty simple function. We're gonna multiply the inputs by some numbers, some coefficients, and we're gonna add them together. And so if I try to answer the question, which input is most important now having seen this, I maybe have some guesses. So input one is very large. It makes up a big proportion of my output. So maybe it's most important. Input two has a bigger coefficient. Maybe it's more important. So I need to maybe more carefully define how I measure this. Um, or maybe I need to know more about the problem, more about the model. And so if I knew more, for example, if I knew what the features were, so I have context, um, now I have a better understanding of what's going on. For example, wearing a hat, I know is always gonna be one or a zero because you are either wearing the hat or you're not wearing the hat, maybe somewhere in between, but it's certainly in that range of zero to one. And it doesn't have a very big impact on the output. You know, the, the full range of values it can take will only move the output by one. So it's not gonna be important regardless of what else is going on. Um, whereas body weight in grams, you know, we know that a pound of body weight is, is 450 grams roughly. And so um, just a small change in your body weight would have a huge change in the output of this function. Um, and body weight varies pretty significantly. Whereas, you know, IQ scores are bounded and don't vary very much and arguably are difficult or impossible to change. And so even though the coefficient is larger, the units are on such a different scale that probably here we would rank, you know, coefficient uh, input one as being the most important thing here. It's really the driving force of our output. Okay, so that got a little messy very quickly for a very simple model. And that was just because of the correlate, um, just because of understanding the scales of these inputs. And so another easy toy example, I've made it easier now. I've, I've stripped away a lot of the confusion because my function takes in our three inputs now and it only cares about the second input. I throw the other two inputs away, I multiply the second input by two, and I get my output. So this should feel like the base case where if this were true, then I know it's only input two that matters. And if this scaled up, if I had a thousand inputs, but only one of them mattered, then that should be the one that gets all the importance. But again, the context might muddy the waters a bit. If I found out that input one and input two are actually closely related to each other. In the extreme, maybe they're the same thing, just on different scales. Um, suddenly, it's philosophically murky how I should think about which one is more important. Certainly, if I changed input one, input two would change and then my output would change. And so now maybe those two inputs are both important, especially if there's some kind of causal link between one and two, I might care. And so that philosophical question actually really matters, how we decide um, to attribute things to, to inputs that are technically not part of the function, but practically matter. Um, if we choose to attribute importance to one or the other, um, that, will, that will change the kinds of answers we're getting when we're, answer, when we're trying to quantify these numbers. Um, so it's already a bit of a slippery, uh, a slippery problem here. And so now we can make it more complicated. And so now this is again a, a simple function, but input three and input one are multiplied together. And so now how important, how, how much of an impact input one has depends on the value of input three. If input three is very large, then input one's really important because small changes in input one will change the output a lot. If input three is negative, then input one has importance in the other direction. Um, and so now suddenly we care about how they interact with each other. We care about how they're related to each other and we have to somehow disentangle that relationship. And of course, you can imagine this can only get more and more difficult as the relationship gets more and more complicated. Um, 
My favorite example is you take that, that tree we had for my daughter, but now we build a hundred different trees. They all take the same inputs, but they're set up in different ways. They all give different outputs. And I just have them vote majority rules. And this is, there are real models that work this way in machine learning. Um, and how do you try to explain what the voting trees are doing? Do you explain each tree and then try to average across them, but that's not really how it works. So uh, it becomes very murky very fast. And then again, the worst case scenario for someone like me who's trying to make these explanations uh, important is what if I don't know? It's a proprietary model. I'm not allowed to see it. And I don't know how it works. And so uh, I will, so I wanna, I wanna pose all this because I want you to come away from this with, uh, this problem is very slippery, both philosophically and practically. And um, it's not always, you would, you would hope that people employing these tools have very good answers to these questions. Why is my, um, why is my function making this decision? Why is my model fitting out this decision? And the truth is that only a fraction of people who are using these methods are actually asking that question. And only a fraction of the people asking are getting answers that are satisfactory because the tools are still being developed. And so um, just to give you a big picture of the modern approaches to answering these questions, um, there's global surrogates, which are a bit of an older method. And the idea here is, well, we know that those simpler models are easier to explain. So why don't we just approximate your complicated thing with a simpler thing? So I try to build a model that when given the same inputs gives roughly the same output on average. And I try to do as well as I can to perfectly approximate it. And then I try to explain that simple model, like a linear model or a simple decision tree. Um, this is really hard to do. As you can imagine, the reason we're using the complicated model in the first place is that it's the, the process is complicated to model. It's what it's doing is hard. And so the simple model is probably not good enough. Um, that's difficult. And an easier method that's caught on a lot of popularity lately, and there are many different implementations of how to do this, again, quibbling over the philosophical assumptions that you want to make are local surrogates. So we're, we're, we take the inputs that you have and we shock them a little bit. We just perturb the values, you know, with, you know all the different directions. So we move hat by like a little bit and we move body weight by a little bit and we see how that changes the output. And that's a very popular way to do this. Uh, it has its own problems that it runs into, especially if there are uh, sharp boundaries and you try to perturb across those, but um, this is very popular. And then the area that I think about the most that my research is in um, are, is this idea of input permutations. And the idea there being, well, what if I compare you to your inputs to maybe the average input? And I take your input for your value for input two, and I just change it to the average value for input two. And then I do that again with a different input and a different input. And I sort of keep track of how much changing your input to the average inputs changes your prediction towards the average or your uh, output to the average output. And if I do that in one order, and then I do it in another order and in another order, and I average across the orders, I might get some sense of the value of each of those inputs by seeing how much they changed it marginally as compared to a baseline, or maybe as compared to a specific baseline that I care about. Um, and a similar method known as counterfactuals um, does sort of the reverse, which is instead of doing all the changes, they try to do the smallest change they can to get you a different decision. So let's say your credit card application was rejected. I look for the shortest path in, in the input space to, to change you to being accepted. And I try to find a lot of good examples of, you know, the sort of the smallest change I needed to do to change it. And then I present you with that. So I give you like a little portfolio of counterfactuals and that sort of helps you understand what you needed to have done to get a different output. Um, that's very difficult to do, but when it works, it's a, it's a nice uh, explanation of what's going on. And so I want to leave you with, without getting into the technical details of how these methods work, there is no best method that has been agreed upon. And they come with significant philosophical and practical trade-offs. Some of the practical trade-offs are very meaningful. If it takes days and weeks and months to analyze why the decision was made, then it's not worth asking the question if, if I needed to tell them within seconds. Um, you know, maybe I want the app to say after it's declined why it was declined. Um, and from a philosophical perspective, you know, if we can't agree on what they should be doing in the simple cases, it's very difficult then to hope that they're um, worth the complicated cases. In fact, they're not. These three, these three broad categories of methods on the same model, you'll get very different answers. And, and that uh, I think should worry you, um, but also imply that we need a more broad approach to doing this and maybe using, using multiple approaches and understanding how they differ will help us get a more holistic understanding of what the, what the 
what these how these decisions are being made. And so with that, I think uh, my internet held up, so I'm not going to risk going any longer over time. And so uh, I'll open it up to questions and, and thank you all again. Thank you, Ben. I'm glad your internet was stable for that. I, I see uh, we have a question from Stuart. Please, Stuart, go ahead and make yourself visible. Yes, hi. Um, thank you very much. Uh, enjoyed your presentation. Um, my question is about uh, reviewing the effectiveness of such uh, models. Um, uh, is there a process for reviewing them um, and uh, considering the uh, outliers, which might be unfairly uh, excluded or skipped over? Um, and is this ever um, routinely uh, included in, in a review process? Uh, you know, for 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 um, making the model uh, better and more accurate. Uh, and related to that, you mentioned um, uh, users um, wanting to learn how. Uh, they might have been uh, rejected, uh, that sort of thing. And I'm wondering uh, about how that would be uh, viewed uh, by the implementers of such models because the, they might uh, say, well, we don't want the users to know because then they might try to game the system. Thank you. Yes. So I'm going to answer those questions in opposite order. Um, so so that's a very good point. Um, so the, the notion of like adversarial attack, that if I, if I let them... Uh, Figure out what they needed to change. They'll just make those changes until, and and that's um that's something you wouldn't you wouldn't want to open up your data or function to bad actors in that case. So you you would you would generally be in control as the as the owner of the model of, of what you release. And so you know if you have a good faith credit card applicant, you might give them a these are the top three reasons why. But if you're um you know if if you're employing some kind of uh, complicated model for, for picking, um, I don't know, it's something more limited resources and in, into competition to get um, in or, or so you were worried about people gaming the system, you wouldn't, you wouldn't let them do it repetitively, right? You wouldn't let them try. Generally speaking, if you like, can fill out a form infinite times, you'll, you'll get the answer right by just tweaking things. Um, but the other thing is that if you set the algorithm up right, so we answered, we asked the questions that we care about as the, as the owner of the, of the model, if only important features matter, then tweaking, for example, favorite color won't, won't affect the outcome. So if you've, if you've asked these questions carefully from the outset, then they have to change things that matter. So if, like, if the way they game the system is by going out and getting a better job or going out and, and paying their credit card debt off, then that's sort of a win for you, right? They haven't really gamed the system. They've only used a, a meaningful feature. If, if the way that they you know, change is by writing emails in all caps as opposed to lowercase, then, then you know, it, it's more that you had a vulnerability in your model than that you know, they necessarily did something wrong and there's some balance there between who's, who's, uh, who it's incumbent on to make sure that that security exists. But um, yeah, I think that's a bit tricky, um, but definitely something you'd be worried about. So in, in, in an instance like that, you wouldn't want to give away information uh, if you were trying to protect it. But the regulators would still probably want to know and they maybe just wouldn't make it public, but they would want to understand what's going on. And so uh, to your first part of your question, um, some people think about this question in the other dimension. So you ask about outliers. So instead of thinking about which inputs were important, I could ask the question, which um, training examples were important? And then I could see, well, how important was this outlier on the decision that happened for this person? So, you know, I have, let's say I trained with 10,000 people in my data set. Uh, how important were each keep, was each person in the data set um, in the decision I made for a person I care about now or the new person who walks in the door? And if there are some points that have more importance than others, that might matter. And you might want to say, hey, is this, should this person actually be in my training set? Are they actually a true outlier because there was a mistake, right? Is it, is it a typo? Or are they a uh, representative outlier that I do need to keep in and I, maybe I need to make my model more robust and careful? Um, so that's usually used in diagnostics. And so, it, so broadly speaking, the, some of these tools are used by people who are being careful. Um, and when they do that, it, it generally fits into the life cycle of I'm training a model. I got data. I fit the model. I look at how it's doing. And then I go back and either get new data or change how the model is being trained. And then I repeat that cycle. And, it, and a healthy uh, development cycle includes looking at things like um, variable importance or you know, this type of uh, understanding of the decision-making process and also on the fairness side. Um, this framework doesn't give you guarantees about fairness, 
And so there are other methods that are more commonly used for measuring fairness. So the focus of this is not fairness, although it can very much point you towards things that are unfair. So it's, it's very likely if, 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 a, uh, if a feature that should be protected is popping up as important, it's very likely that your process, that your model is unfair, but there's not necessarily a, a mathematical guarantee that it is. So that's an important distinction that it, it's actually a connection that we're trying to explore. And so there's active research on that. But uh, I will say that uh, algorithmic fairness, which is a separate field, is very, it's also, there's a great philosophical divide on how one would define what it means to be fair. Um, and so equally, equally difficult to nail down on what our target is, what, what we want to be uh, the best solution. Well, I think, thank, thank you. I think that with, with, with respect to target, I think, uh, again, I'm speaking as a lay person, uh, but I'm thinking that, uh, like, for example, email spams, you've got false positives and false negatives, or you've got uh, a person walking into a store uh, and the store salespeople um, would uh, unconsciously uh, be using a model or maybe these days, uh, maybe there's more of a, um, a formal uh, model that would uh, re review the customer and say this is a this is a hot prospect because he's got a, a Rolex on, or uh, or or th chase this guy out the door because he's wearing uh, ripped jeans when actually he might be you know a very wealthy guy wearing ripped jeans, right? A uh, good prospect. Uh, but but with regard to the emails, there isn't really a fairness because the email doesn't really care whether or not it was a false positive or a false negative. But the the customer who, who me who who needs to go look in my spam folder for for false uh, positives, you know, I, I care about about the uh, validity of the uh, the model, and so I'm wondering about reviewing uh, those false positives and false negatives of of the rejections or acceptances that are in, in, inaccurate for uh, uh, making the model a better model. Yeah, so I guess to answer that in a couple of different ways, uh, one is that. Um, you can do the same process, but instead of trying to explain the decision, you can try to explain the errors. So like, why, why does it make errors on these types of people? Um, and that's, because uh, then you're, instead of the model being the model that does the prediction or the model that makes the decision, the model is just the function that gives you the error. And you're trying to explain why it made the error is a, another use of these tools. And it can often highlight, well, for this subset of the population, we make this error because we don't understand, you know, for example, with spam, if you're a non-English speaker or non-English typer, there are certain types of spam that are not gonna get caught or gonna get overly caught because the system is trained on English speaking emails for the most part. And then that's like, you know, they've been trying to develop better spam catchers, but uh, that's often a case of, you know, I'm an underrepresented part of the sample. And so I have worse error. This will highlight sort of which features are really contributing to that. So this is definitely a use case for it. Um, and then, Again, from a fairness perspective, it really matters the, 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 how important are the decisions being made. You know, if it's just spam, that's probably not as important. But if, if we're, we're talking about things that are, um, you know, any type of interaction that's potentially legally protected uh, for different types of classes, then we're going to care a lot about fairness. You know, um, looking for things like redlining, uh, that, that's the type of stuff that could come up and be caught by these types of methods. And, and in those cases, uh, yeah, I think the government oversight is not quite there and the legal definitions and the algorithmic definitions are not necessarily perfectly in line right now. And so there's been a lot of writing about um, whether or not the machine learning community needs to change how it thinks about fairness or if the legal community, if the, if the government needs to change the, the laws to more reflect what we can actually measure um, and what fairness really is. Uh, there's a, the notion of fairness by unawareness is one that I think uh, is worth a different talk at Wonderfest, but uh, that that's a, a big issue in the community, whereby you actually can get less fair outcome by being uh, by ignoring the protected features, um, which is unintuitive, I think, at first glance for a lot of people. That you would, you know, if you don't think about the protected feature, then then how can it inform the decision? But as we just talked about, if it's related to other features, even even on uh, you know unconsciously, you can you know, impact the outcome and become unfair. And so that uh, fairness by unawareness doesn't work well, but it's often the legal standard. And that's uh, problematic. So again, that's beyond the scope of what I've been talking about tonight, but it is a topic near and dear to my uh, focus. Great, thank you. Um, um, uh, if I can squeeze in one more. Uh, um, as you're talking, I'm thinking about uh, the regulators are trying to um, uh, review such models uh, for fairness and for uh, illegality, illegality. Uh, sounds like 
there is no um, measurement standard. Uh, I'm thinking of um, uh, the the food food and drug. Uh, they actually have a standard that allows a certain number of uh, insect particles or rat poop or whatever. You know, if it's less than this number, then it's acceptable uh, quality. Uh, so I'm wondering if there was a, any kind of a standard for for um, measuring the um, the fairness or the uh, rejected uh, quantity. So the um, the legal standard depends a bit on the uh, setting. And so I know, for example, like the uh, for housing in particular, there are very strict standards of, of what the, how you measure the, you know, how uh, imbalanced the outcomes are. Um, and for other situations, they don't have a developed standards because this is all relatively new. And so, for example, I know that the IRS is actively working on measuring and thinking about fairness in respect to what they are doing themselves. So this is oversight on themselves, but, but um, you know, fundamentally important. Uh, and as these tools are, again, you have to dis- decide what the right definition of fairness is. Is it false positive rate? Is it, is it false negative rate? Is it, um, that, that there's a wide, uh, there's a wide number of incompatible definitions of fairness. Um, and so you have to pick one because they're incompatible and that can lead to disagreement. I, again, there's a, an older set of legal standards that sort of dominates how this is decided for the most part right now. And I think there's some thought about whether or not that needs to be updated at a federal level, but there, um, I would say that we're behind both on, you know, knowing how to use these tools and also doing this analysis. And there's not, uh, we're not quite there yet as a country. And, and this is a problem because as I said, re- really fundamentally important. It's not that this is about to happen. This is already happening. This is, these types of tools are widely used in production. And so, um, and in certain situations, they're not, you know, it, it's not clear who has oversight in some situations, you know, in the financial services industry, there's more, there's more oversight potentially, um, because there's a history of unfair practices, right? So anywhere where there's a history of unfair practice, there's more focus. And, and I will say also to, to not totally be a doomsday um, chicken little, um, often even a flawed uh, automated implementation is better than the previous human version. So that's not always the case, but it is often the case. Um, so don't, don't necessarily think that we're, we're you know, headed downhill in, in a bad direction, but um, we're definitely not being as careful as I would like as a society. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for your question, Stuart. I see Alan Winson has a question. I'll read it, I guess, Alan, if you don't mind. As these systems become increasingly complicated and make more consequential decisions, should we give a, should we give, give up hope that they will be able to explain to us why and how they arrived at their decisions in a way that we can understand? I would say no, in the sense that we passed the point of where they're too complicated a long time ago. And so all the methods I'm talking about now should scale with the, they don't, they like, it becoming more complicated is not a problem. It's the question of whether we can solve the like medium problem. If we could do that, we could solve the hard problem. So there's not, uh, there's not, because at the end of the day, if I can solve the problem of, I don't even know what the function is doing, I can't even see inside the box. If I can solve that problem to it, and it won't be perfect, right? Because again, you're never going to fully understand it. But if I can get a good answer, an answer that we agree is, is useful and meaningful, then in that situation, it, it should scale to any sort of complicated model because I could, of course, always just cover the box if I don't want to look at how scary and complicated it is and, and be happy with what's, what I'm getting. And, and those answers, again, aren't, are, we're still working on what is the right and best answer. And again, I don't think there's going to be one, as this slide still says, I don't think there's going to be one best method. It's going to be some sort of tool belt that you use that you pull out for different scenarios and, and in different situations. But yeah, I, think, I don't think we should give up hope, but I'm biased because I, I, I'm trying to answer the question. Uh, Thank you, Alan, for the question. Let me ask Ben, uh, you know, when I picture Erin, our first speaker, Erin at at work, when she's really loving her work, she's out in a field somewhere, maybe with a pair of binoculars, keeping her eyes on some ground squirrels. When you're loving your work the most, are you doing what I've heard mathematicians use as tools? You've got a, a pencil, a piece of paper and a trash can. What, and what, what's your, your method of, uh, of work in your field? Uh, I would say I'm more of a whiteboard and marker um, worker, but but it's uh, 
I, my favorite way to attack this type of problem, which doesn't have like a great ground truth, is coming up with annoying counterexamples and toy examples that break what I'm trying to do, and so or break what other people have done. And that's uh, that's where I definitely am most happy in the field is uh, is coming up with a toy model that our explanation doesn't make sense for, and someone else's explanation doesn't make sense for, and either we need a better explanation or we need to figure out why that doesn't work well. Um, so that's my my favorite thing to do. But uh, I'm certainly sitting in front of this computer a lot while I'm doing work, um, which is nice because, uh, like I said, I have a young daughter at home, and that means. Uh, yeah. Well, although if I was studying squirrels, it'd be pretty nice to take her out to the park too. So luckily for us, we have a visitor, as Aaron noted, uh, the squirrels are pretty habitual and I get a nice uh, medium black uh, for squirrel that visits our, our uh, side yard every, every morning, basically. So, um, All right. Boy, thank you, Ben. You know, we're, we're over time here. I promise this event would only last one hour. I, I, that's my mistake. I'm sorry about that, when I, but I want to live up to it. Thank you everyone for being here. And remember that our next event, the next Wonderfest event happens at 7 p.m. on Monday, April 25th. It's Starship Reality Check with Dr. Pascal Lee. It's a live event in Novato at Hot Monk Tavern. 